The devastation extends beyond the rubble of the World Trade Center. It goes to the heart of hundreds of communities in the suburbs of New York where families are mourning the loss of loved ones who are still missing, places like Summit, New Jersey. In this town of 21,000 people, about 3,000 of them, 20% of the adult population, worked as bond traders, investment bankers, stockbrokers, and clerks in the Twin Towers and surrounding buildings. Town leaders say as many as 50 of them may be unaccounted for. There are few towns in America as comfortable and seemingly sheltered as Summit, New Jersey, a community where everyone knows his or her neighbors. One reason people live here is because the ride to work is so easy. 35 minutes by train to the World Trade Center. Just outside the Summit train station, officials are keeping close watch of the parking lots where some commuters who left on Tuesday morning have yet to pick up their cars, a grim sign that they may never return. The other night, across from the train station, about 3,000 residents filled the village green at a candlelight prayer service, trying to comprehend the incomprehensible. I'd like to read as we begin from Psalm 13. How long will this pain go on, Lord? This grief I can hardly bear. Richard Rosen came with his wife and two children. In this community, they've snuffed out the lives of people who you know, coached their kids soccer, who walked their kids to school, went out to have a beer with their friends, and it just really gets right to the heart of this community. And that's, you know, it's just such a loss. Of the many parents who work in the financial district, one of them is Michael Mohern. And it could have been me. When I used to work in the World Trade Center. It could have been me. It could very well be my children crying and my children being brought food and my children being worried about and being prayed over. Ann Grieski's seven-year-old son gave no clue that he was aware of the attack until he drew this picture that night of a plane crashing into the World Trade Center. It makes me sad to think that he's having to Deal, when I don't think he's dealing with it, he, he is having to deal with it in his own little way. I'm not sure just how to help him with that. Hear our tearful prayers for the lost and injured. During the service, as Especially the minister called out the names of dozens of people who are still missing. For David Brady, Edward Calderon, for Jim Connors. The magnitude of this disaster on this small town hit home. For Tom Glazer for Bob Lawrence, for Todd Ranke. Todd Ranke, a father of three young children, worked as a bond salesman at Sandler O'Neill in the World Trade Center Tower Number 2 on the 104th floor. He calls every morning when he's at work. He was on the phone with his wife, Debbie, when the first plane hit. It was a little before 9, and uh, he called, and said, good morning, how are the kids, how are you? And he said, oh my God, we've been hit, something is the matter, something happened. Boy, that was loud. Mm. And I said, Todd, get out of there. I, I see fire and it looks like it's very close to your building, get out. So you were watching this on, on television? Yeah, just come on TV, I had the news on. I'm, I always listen to the news, always and it just popped up and I said, listen to me, you got to get out of there. And then I can't remember what happened next. Soon after that phone call, the second plane smashed into tower number two. Two of Todd Ranke's co-workers at Sandler O'Neill were killed. Twenty managed to escape. Sixty-six are still missing. At this point, you still have hope. You haven't given up. Oh, no. The reason I'm doing this interview is because I think he's out there and he can't tell me where he is. Debbie came to us because one of her neighbors and friends in Summit is Michael Radutsky, producer here at 60 Minutes. She asked his help in finding her husband. So on Wednesday morning, we set out with Debbie and the family, a dozen people in all. Over the next two days, they searched all across the city. 
Now we just want to know yeah. when they will start identifying und unidentified people. Todd's three sisters are the leaders of the search party. We have to be there for Todd, and as Debbie said the first night, she said, I know Todd would be looking for me. So we got to walk. You can't sit at home. you got to go keep searching and walking the streets and learning what they're doing in the city. I think we should just, while we're here, cover that so we know we did, we know we did it. The men in the family say they know the women won't give up. They definitely have a mindset, you know, tunnel vision on finding Todd Ranke. Nothing's going to take him off that course. Until they're exhausted and they're going to collapse, they're going to basically say they gave it their best shot. With thousands of people missing, how do they find one man? The morning after the disaster, there was no one list of all the dead, injured, and missing. So they started going to hospitals. NYU, Beth Israel, Cabrini. No Todd Ranke. Must be hard to look at those lists. It is. But they had to keep looking. And then we're looking for other people who Todd worked with. If it was somebody else he worked with, well, maybe if they're in a hospital, maybe Todd's there and just unidentified. That's what you were looking. We were looking for other lists. We just wanted to find somebody in his group to think that if he got out, then maybe Todd got out. The injured were taken to 130 hospitals in the New York area. By the time they got to St. Vincent's Hospital late that afternoon, they finally found the master list with names of all the injured. So far, we don't have the name on the list. Every hour, we update the list. Right. All right. Have so, you gotten any um, names in the last four hours? Um, they have, but as I said, we don't happen to have that particular How name. About that meant that so far, Todd Ranke had not been found alive. It was too much for Debbie to bear. I think by the end of the day, Debbie Plus the end. was tired. We hadn't eaten or had anything. You know, you just keep walking, and then when you keep going and seeing the list and his name did not appear, I think it's she terrible. fell apart. And um, you, so we went home to right. regroup. Well, what's been the toughest thing for you in all of this? Looking at my the brother's children, children. seeing his seven-year-old son. And he's a nine and eleven year old daughter. So well, we walk in every children. night. They greet us, and they say we come my home daddy. with my parents. And the first thing they want to know is, did you find him? And we said, we said no. But I think what our children are seeing, we said we're going back tomorrow. We are going back to find him. While the women took Debbie home, the men continued the search. Their first stop, Chelsea Piers, a sports complex. They'd been told the ice rink was being used as a temporary morgue. They didn't find Todd's body. We're looking for the needle in the haystack. My head tells me I'm not going to find the needle, but my heart's telling me to keep digging in the hay. That frustrating? Yeah, that's the definition of frustration. <laughs> Early Thursday morning, the Ranky family drove back into New York City. By now, the death toll stood at 94, and hope was fading for the more than 4,000 people still listed as missing. Along with thousands of others, the Rankies went to the armory where, for the first time, there was a list that included the dead as well as identifiable body parts. That is the most disgusting thing I've ever done in my life, is to look for my brother on a list, which list right hand, you know, nail biter, um, people by their license plate number, I mean their driver's license. I said, it's, it's like a war. It's like looking at the, the, the list of the dead from the war. It is a disgusting thing to do. I, mean, I don't think I'll ever be able to look at a list of names again without thinking of how many lists I've looked for the name Ranky on and not seen it. Todd Ranky was not on the list of the dead or the list of injured at any hospital. What do you do next? I ask myself that every day. What can we do next? And, and uh, we regroup and we keep calling hospitals. We talk to people who can uh, put his picture out and, and continue to look for him, watch the news to see if anybody else has been found. And uh, we come into New York every day looking for answers. I hope you find. We're a strong group and we're going to get through this. I can see that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Just yeah. whatever you can. On Friday night back in Summit, New Jersey, family members and neighbors put up a flagpole on the Rankies front lawn. You pull it, Todd. Pull it, Todd. Todd Jr. raised the American flag and then the children lowered it to half staff. 